you out here this morning. I saw John motioning for people to come forward. That would, yeah. That would work out just fine. It's cooler up here. Is it? Yeah. I didn't start talking. Right now. <laughs> I didn't start talking. <laughs> but I did catch that. <laughs> Good to see all of you out here this morning. And just it's great to be in the house of God, isn't it? I hope you enjoy those of you that are here our time of fellowship this morning. Um, let's start with a word of prayer and we'll get right in. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for the sunshine that you have for us, not only outside, but in our hearts. And I pray that you just bless us in a special way this morning and just meet with us in our service in your name. Amen. All right, grab a hymnal. We're going to sing. Stand together with me and we're going to sing first from hymn number 588. 588. Let's stand together. I can just say amen to that, Dean. I'm, I'll trust you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody else? This, I was thinking this whole week, this, the many blessings um, that we all have. I mean, just myself, I'm just thinking, I'm truly, truly blessed. And undeservingly in, in this big, big universe that we have no comprehension of. Here we are, the only person on this huge earth in our eyes. Yep. So much, so, so blessed. We'll talk a little bit about that here today. Yep. That's awesome. Somebody else? Monica? I just finished a book called God Smuggler. It's on mm -hmm. the life of Brother Andrew, who has amazing and how we 
take for granted how multiple lives in our lives. Yep. It's just uh, over and over. I God knows it's me. It's all the countries we've been in. I think he's still alive. I can look at him in 94 or something okay. like that. But what an amazing. And it just brings to mind that we take for granted our lives. <coughs> How many of you can say that you have at least 10 Bibles in your home? At least probably more. <coughs> I have three. And if you count what you have available online. Uh, Darlene, was it? No, Ruby. Driving through our town this week, one of the church bulletin boards was a messy. God's arms are always open. And that was a special message to us this week. Especially with the concerns with our family and health issues. Yeah. I do praise God for his um, healing and and restoring stress for my brother Glenn and also to our son Brian in Texas. He is improving and it's just good to know that God's arms are always open as we bring our concerns to him and we praise God for all the people here at our church family. Good, good to hear. Anybody else? Anybody else? Good. Um, I've been struggling a lot with my job and between the travel, going all over the place, different properties in Cologne County. So last week I got an email out of the blue from a company I emailed with last fall and praise God I'll be starting a new job in Chambersburg, same type of work. Of property management okay but I'll be have one property and what I really am going to enjoy about this is um, there are certain units that are specified for domestic violence women okay so I'm looking forward to being able to work with them as well okay. and be try to be an encouragement for them that's really so, cool yeah wow. I'm excited about my new job great <laughs> me too <laughs> <laughs> Less driving for sure. Yes. I just have to say, uh, a little angel came to visit me this week. I was feeling down and I had this cough that just wouldn't go away and it wore me out. And so this little angel from church texted me and said, I'm making salad. Can I bring you some of it? And I said, Yes, but I got a bug and you might not want it. Oh, she said, that's okay. And so they brought me the salad, plus, 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 plus. And that lifted me. And I'm feeling better. I seem like a dumb call. <laughs> See, I told you, I had I called your name a while ago. You just weren't ready yet. Yeah. I saw someone else, though. Uh, I just want to thank everyone for their cards and prayers during some, my survey this time. Deb just loves back surgery. <laughs> now the truth comes out. <laughs> good call there, Diane. He does a good job of it. Yeah. That's a fact, pretty cool. Bobby? Uh, just want to thank God for answering the prayer and blessing us with uh, Jerry's situation at work. Um, we thought we knew what he was had planned for us. We thought he was going to do a, a lot of another job. So we gave to get away from that and get into something that would have been a little bit easier, so to speak. Um, but that didn't pay nice. We decided that that wasn't what we wanted her to do. And, uh, so we opted with plan B or C or wherever we were called up with our plans there and just decided we'd just go let her stay home, just do stuff in there and that provided the provider more Sundays and stuff like that. So. That's much appreciated, huh? So that's not, well, I think it says it is a new job. 
Sort of. Well, no. Same job. No, it's like part time now because I was still doing that and working forty hours. So mm. it's like stepping down to a part time. Okay. <laughs> so semi retired. <laughs> Anybody else get a new job this week? <laughs> I've got one available if anyone wants one. Oh, uh-huh. I have a feeling I know what that is. Insurance agent. Oh, I thought maybe babysitter. <laughs> I apologize now for the squirrels I brought to church. Well, squirrels are needed saved too, so. Somebody else. That's right. I just thank God for the nuts or the squirrels. Yep. Are you one of the nuts, John? Absolutely. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> I always enjoy hearing praises and sharing, and that just that's special to me. Um, so, you're all done. Our parashas are ready. We will take up our off. All right, please. God had the Father we pause before you this morning, Lord. We just praise you for everything you blessed us with. Praise you for the church and the church family that we have. Now, Lord, as we have the opportunity to give back to your work, we just praise you. Bless this offering and it's lifted. Let's pray for both the gift and giver and for those that couldn't. Thank you for asking. Thank you for Jesus' name. spoken to her on the phone yet. She's been pretty busy. I have as well, but keep praying for Bill. Is that the only other one I have to update you on? And have, Ruby already updated us on Brian. So I think that was it. Anybody else? Any other prayer requests? Um, I'd like to put in a prayer request for my brother. He's had an A-stroke. Oh, wow. Um, He's got Parkinson's, they think. And, uh, and I mean, I do want to purge that, but he's like having a hard time handling his anger. So his anger is out of control, mm-hmm. and they upped his anger medicine. Uh, so <laughs> we just, you know, it's not good to be angry, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and he kind of blacks it out. So, well, you know, I just don't want to hurt anybody. Yeah, okay. Let's pray for that. Um, Lily? Oh, yeah. You're Lily, right? I also prayed Wednesday night when my back. And um, as of today, it's kind of like falling down. And almost gone. Good. Your back's almost gone. <laughs> oh, I had to clear that up. <laughs> That's what she said. She said her back is almost gone. That's good to hear. Yeah. Praying for you. Good. Get out there and do some more shoveling, and that'll fix that right up. Somebody else? Yes. Um, I want to pray, have prayer request for Joe. We're struggling with keeping his sugar levels down. 
Um, and it's a struggle. Also, I took him Friday morning for some tests, so we gotta see where that's gonna go. We'll have to see a surgeon, possibly. Sure. Pray for that. Yes. Karen? I remember my parents. My mom just had an episode of low sugar this morning, and they were supposed to come down for Olivia's recital, but now they're not coming, so that is a concern. Your cycle today? Good day. Thousands and thousands of people coming. Millions. Millions. Trillions. Yeah, yeah. That's definitely great for Karen's parents. I know that's I that's that very odd struggle when your parents are now needing care and it's yeah. Let's pray for that. Somebody else. All done. And join me as we go to prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for, for you and for who you are and for what you've done for us. And we praise you that you have provided such an awesome way to gain freedom, that we can live in victory, that we can live for you, that we don't have to be in bondage. And we just praise you for that. Thank you for our church, for our family. I pray you continue to encourage and lift up and strengthen each one. Every one of us is carrying some kind of a load, some kind of a burden. Sometimes we don't talk about them, sometimes we do, but Lord, would you just help us to you know, lay them at your feet and to, and to lean on you. Pray that you'll help us as we're moving forward into VBS here in a few weeks, would you um, give direction and wisdom and, and help that to be the ministry that you want it to be. Would you be with us in a special way here this morning as we worship you and study your word? Would you help us to listen to your voice? We think of those that are struggling physically. We think of Bill this morning. Would you help him? Give him a touch and be with Ruth. Would you be near Tim? Continue to strengthen and lift him up. Help Jack as well, Lord. Encourage him. We think of Claire as he's still struggling and pray for his brother Stan as well. Thank you for the way you've been with Deb and Lord, give her healing and help this to be it now for this, this problem and that she'll be able to return to normal. Thank you for the way you've helped Glenn this week and just continue to help him. He's got a lot going on. I pray to strengthen him and help Ruby as she works with him, be with Brian, continue to help him, strengthen him, and give him healing. To be with Joey's brother is Sounds like he's really dealing with a lot. Would you just help him first to see how you love him and you care about him? And would you help him to be able to uh, see you real in his life? And would you give him a special touch? Be with Joe and uh, his physical struggles there and the tests and things they are getting done. And be with Sue and John as they have to work with that and decisions to make. Would you give uh, direction and healing? And be with Karen's parents. There's a uh, struggling there physically and I pray to be with them. And be with those that are always affected by those that are struggling. And would you give encouragement and strength? Thank you, Lord. We can come to you. We can lay our burdens at your feet and we know that you care. And would you help us each right now to focus on you and worship you in your name. Amen. So, if you have not come to our focus group yet on Sunday night, you need to come to our focus group on Sunday night. That's tonight at 7, and bring a snack. If you need specifics of what to bring, give me a call, and I will let you know what you can bring. Um, depends what I'm hungry for. And, um, <laughs> Cindy makes some good little whatever they're called, and bread wrap something. What are they called, Cindy? Blinnies. Blinnies. Yeah, that's exactly what I thought when I saw them. And, uh, <laughs> But they're good. She can bring them. So we'll start with that. <laughs> we'll start with that. <laughs> anyway, come to our focus group. We really have a good time and fellowship and discussion. And that's tonight at seven. Um, 
Tuesday night board meeting at six o'clock. Board members remember that. Those of you that are here. Did you get more directories on Alicia? Okay, so uh, there is a refresh of directories in the back. If you have not gotten your directory yet, Victoria directory, please get one, one per family, and then we'll see how many are left, and then if you need more, you get more, and we'll have plenty. And also, if you have not gotten the app for your phone and you want it, please ask me and I'll tell you how to do it. Uh, I haven't heard from many here recently, so I think most of you have it figured out, but if you need directions on that, let me know. They are going to be decorating tomorrow for VBS starting at three o'clock until whenever they're done. So they're needing help with that. So if you're able to come and help decorate, that would be super. Also um, down on the kitchen counter, old kitchen counter, there are postcards advertising VBS. If you want to grab some of them and hand them out to friends and family and neighbors and whatnot. They're actually on the free table. They're on the free table, but they're downstairs. Um, and that's coming up quick. What we got? A we two weeks. Two weeks. So be praying about that and uh, be ready to help. Any announcements I'm missing? Jerry? The next group normally would be the last Friday. So Sorry, yes. That's been changed, so it's not this Friday because of the Memorial Day weekend. So it'll be the next Friday. June 3rd, 4th? Thank you, Deb. She is a good calendar, I tell you. That's at six thirty. All right. Sunday night, then we will have to bring the snacks. Just bring yourselves. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'll back you up on that. All right, thanks. I know that's hard to accept, but <laughs> no, that's important. Yeah, it's yourself. a good time of fellowship. It really is. All right, we have a special by, I, don't, I think it's going to be a long special. reminder that we need to tell 
Jesus about everything. Do you know that Jesus wants to hear from you and he wants you to talk to him? Even though he knows everything about you and whatever's going on already, you still need to talk to him about it. And I'm a very firm believer in you telling Jesus everything, what you're feeling, how you're thinking, just tell him. Because he wants to hear it. So, it's a good reminder. Thanks, ladies. I appreciate that. Turn your Bibles with me to Psalms 36. <coughs> Psalm 36. There, two weeks ago, we were on vacation. I read this chapter, and uh, as soon as I started reading, the words just started ringing true for me. I think because of some things I've been going through personally and just the current world situation or, or um, climate, if you want to call it that, that we're living in, and I'm not going to give a long introduction stories or anything. I just want to take this chapter this morning and walk our way through it. And the Bible I read out of is uh, was the NIV. I'm not even sure which NIV it was, but the way it was written is what it just rang true for me. And so I decided I'm going to copy exactly how it was written in the Bible that I was reading. And that way you can hear what I read. Psalms 36, I have a message from God in my heart concerning the sinfulness of the wicked. There is no fear of God before their eyes. In their own eyes, they flatter themselves too much to detect or hate their sin. The words of their mouths are wicked and deceitful. They fail to act wisely or do good. Even on their beds, they plot evil. They commit themselves to a sinful course and do not reject what is wrong. Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the highest mountains, your justice like the great deep. You, Lord, preserve both people and animals. How priceless is your unfailing love, O God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights. For with you is the fountain of life, in your light we see light. Continue your love to those who know you, your righteousness to the upright in heart. May the foot of the proud not come against me, nor the hand of the wicked drive me away. See how the evildoers have fallen, or lie fallen, thrown down, not able to rise. <coughs> David certainly had his share of trouble in his life. And I think we can actually relate to what David had to deal with. Just think about it for a minute with me. Early on, what was his one main adversary? King Saul. The king. Like that was his, that was his adversary. And why was Saul his adversary during this period? He was jealous. He was jealous of what David would become. He would take his place. They started on this really good relationship, but Saul turned on him and betrayed him. And I think we can all relate to the situation because we likely have all had situations where we have felt betrayed in our lives. And I'll mention another situation that David dealt with. These are just two I'm mentioning. Another adversary he had, his very own son, Absalom. Now, if that doesn't cause a person personal anguish, I don't know what would. Not only did his son rebel, but his son was against, like coming against him. And those are just two of the many situations that David dealt with and struggled with. And I think we can agree that David, throughout his life, had enough experience on the subject of people doing evil that he could write about it with experience and uh, be enough, be well versed in the subject. I wouldn't be surprised if his own personal experiences and failures have played a role to some degree in this psalm as well. 
So let's just go ahead. I want to work our way through this chapter verse by verse and see what we can learn from David's words as inspired by both his and our Heavenly Father. First, he has a message from God. We start from the first verse, and I don't know if you hear or heard what I heard there, but it seems like David has a heavy heart when he starts this chapter. I have a message from God in my heart concerning the sinfulness of the wicked. It really seems to me like David is weighed down by the sinful condition that he was seeing around him. And he then says there's, just, there's no fear of God in their eyes. David is saying he's so burdened with how people are sinning. He's so concerned because they don't even seem to care. They don't have the respect, the awe, the reverence of God that they should have. They're just callously living their sinful life with any regard like God doesn't even see or is not watching. And boy, does that verse ring true to us today. First off, think about it this way. If you are serving the Lord, do you realize that He has given all of us that are serving God a message to share with the world? The message is that people need to repent of their sinful ways and accept God's incredible gift of salvation. I don't think I need to tell you that sin is rampant today. It's evident. It's clear. But what I do think is pretty clear is we aren't doing enough about it. And I think you could all agree with me on that. Oh, we agree that sin is rampant and the world is broken and messed up, but it seems like so many times we're so good at talking about it. And not very good at doing anything about it. Are we really truly sharing with others that beautiful message from God that there is a better way to live? Are we warning people that God isn't sitting idly by like he doesn't care while people thumb their noses at anything holy like it doesn't really matter? There's going to come a day when rewards are going to be given out and I don't want to be in that camp and that group that people will say he didn't do anything about it. He didn't do his part to warn us. People are living today like God doesn't care. And you know what concerns me? I see it in the church, like the church world today, especially in America. People who call themselves Christians are living their own ways like God doesn't really care what they do. Oh, I don't think we need to fear God. Like, when we, they use the word fear in Scripture, it's not this fear of, oh, God's some monster that's going to stomp on us. That's not that kind of fear. But this fear David's talking about is this awe, a great respect, this, this uh, holy reverence that God is mighty and just. He's not going to allow evil to prosper forever. And really, that should give us a sense of peace because the chaos we see, we know, is not going to continue forever. So that is the message we need to be sharing. God is mighty. He's just. He offers a better way. Are we doing our job? Then let's look at verse 2. In their own eyes, they flatter themselves too much to detect or hate their sin. <clears throat> David is seeing those that are doing evil and, and, and they're so convinced that they're doing okay or doing right, they can't even see the evil they're committing. They can't tell they're doing anything wrong. They can't, they don't even know enough to hate it. And those are strong words. But again, what a comparison we can see to today. There are people in our world that are doing despicable things, but yet they think they're doing okay. Either they're completely ignoring the fact that they know they're doing wrong, or they simply are so deceived by Satan that they think they're actually doing right. Either way, they obviously don't hate what they're doing because they're still doing it. And I want us to look first at our own lives. Have we evaluated our own lifestyles and actions against God's word to make sure that we're doing what is right? Are we listening to the Spirit's promptings whether we need a course change? I don't want to find myself in the group that is so blinded by the enemy that I can't even see if I'm doing something wrong. And I think it is so easy to get caught up in that, so self-absorbed in a certain agenda or a certain mission or cause that I become blinded <coughs> to the fact that maybe I'm not on the right track. 
And as I was studying this, I was reminded of a verse that David used later on in the, in the book of Psalms. Psalms 139, 23, and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. We can easily go through life thinking I'm, I'm on the right path spiritually, but it is very possible we're missing something if we're not in tune with God and asking Him to show us. Because as humans, we can get so wrapped up in our own ideas and agendas that we lose track of what really God wants for us. So I prayed that the other morning. Lord, search me. Is there something here that's not right? Show me. And we need to do that. It's so easy to become focused on a situation that we might miss the fact that our attitude or actions are not pleasing to God. And then David goes on to describe these evildoers in more detail in these next couple verses. And evil is just central here. Look at verse 3. The words of their mouths are wicked and deceitful. They fail to act wisely or do good. Now, there wasn't a whole lot of information given in the commentaries on this verse. But what I can understand is, in the original Hebrew, the word words here, they're the words of their mouth, is actually more than just what's coming out of their mouth. It is a lifestyle. It is actions. It's conduct. And basically, these evildoers only do evil. They can't do good. But the next verse is even more scary. Verse 4, even on their beds they plot evil. They commit themselves to a sinful course and do not reject what is wrong. And I read this that even when they're sleeping, they're dreaming up evil things to do. I don't know how it works for you guys, but I'm assuming humans are humans, and so... You tend to dream about what is happening in your life. Um, so I tend to dream about things here at church. I have dreams like that. Now, granted, um, going skiing or kayaking with Bill Musser isn't necessarily reality, but you know, this it, you know interweaves into my dreams, right? But what this is saying, I feel like, is if you're living for Satan then even your dreams will be evil. Like, man, can you imagine having evil dreams? Like, I know there's such a thing as a bad dream, but to be constantly dreaming about evil, man, that'd be rough. We have a little fellow that comes over to our bed sometimes <laughs> in the middle of the night crying because he had a super bad dream. Well, that would be super bad, constantly dreaming about evil. And this is a somber reminder of what can happen if we allow Satan to take control. He's tricky. We might not see the gradual slide. But there's going to come a point that Satan has complete reign that anything a person does or even thinks will be bent towards sin. And I don't want to get to that point. Lord, please search my heart and see if there's any wicked way in me. But then David gives some reassuring words that likely came out of his own Failings is in repentance and God's forgiveness. And this is God's infinite love. And I'm not sure entirely what the timeline is of this psalm, but I have a feeling that David is writing this psalm from personal experience with sin and God's forgiveness. And I'm not enough of a Bible scholar to be able to pull out the timeline, whether this was before or after his um, terrible sin with Bathsheba and Uriah, but I really do think this next verse supports that theory. Verse 5 says, Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. And we know that when David wrote this, the, the knowledge about the universe then was very slim compared to what modern, modern scientists and their huge equipment have today. However, the vastness of our known universe, even today, is believed to be only a small fraction of is what, is what is actually out there. And I could go into the, all the scientific details, and I'm not going to because I <clears throat> would have to pull up on my phone because I don't know that. But it's a very minute portion of what we see and what even they've observed with huge telescopes. They say it's much more vast than that. And you know what I think? I think the universe as God created it will never 
be fully discovered. I fully believe that. And that is why David used the term heavens here. He's using a measurement that he knew went far beyond what they could measure. But think about today's modern technological advances. This verse even takes an even deeper meaning. God's love reaches into the heavens. That means with the incredible vast size of what we know the universe to be for now, God's love is still beyond that. And that's a huge kind of love. Isn't it wonderful to know that we're loved with a kind of love that just won't quit? Even in the middle of our failings, God still loves us with a love that's just incredible. Higher than the mountains that I face, stronger than the power of the grave, constant through the trial and the change, one thing remains. Your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. David also describes the faithfulness of God in similar terms. To find a person that's completely faithful is today is pretty hard to do. I don't even, you know, even among Christian circles, to find a completely faithful person, people make mistakes. Someone that is faithful is completely trustworthy, completely reliable, and honest. They don't betray you, they don't lie about you, they don't cheat on you. Even if we have the purest of intentions, we're still human. And our faithfulness might not be the best. However, we know that God is forever faithful. He will never fail us and what he says he will do. And the measure of his faithfulness, again, is a beyond the known universe. I think it's safe to say that we can trust him. He loves us and he will always, always be faithful. But why is it so hard sometimes to trust David goes on to describe God's attributes in verse 6. Your righteousness is like the highest mountains. Your justice is like the deep, great deep. You, Lord, preserve both people and animals. And here David's talking about righteousness. And I think in today's in terminology, we might use the word integrity. There is nothing about God that is unclean, David says. Nothing. David also shows that his justice is limitless. Could we say that both integrity and justice today are severely broken? You can't trust anyone, it seems. And the justice system is a mess. We've seen that. Are we grasping what a privilege and blessing it is to serve a God that is infinitely righteous and infinitely trustworthy? Our God who is perfectly just in all that he does? Then why does this verse say people and animals? It's because God treats the animals with fairness and preserves them with what they need to live. Evil people don't care. They're only looking out for themselves. But God is always faithful, always trustworthy. Then God's love is priceless. Verse 7, how priceless is your unfailing love, O God? People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. Just about everything in our world is based on a monetary system. It's valued according to money. Whether you live in a lavish mansion or just a simple little house. Whether you drive an exotic car or just a simple old Ford. I said that for benefit of someone, but I'm not sure if we caught it. But each thing in our life is based on a monetary system. As sad as it is, even people are based on monetary values. Like, if someone is incredibly wealthy, well, they, they are more important to us than this person is sponging off the government. Isn't that true? It's just how, it, how everyone's viewed. And that's sad. But aren't you glad that God doesn't use that kind of value system? David is saying here that God's love is beyond value in any currency or market. It's absolutely priceless. If you've experienced that love, I think you'll agree with what David is saying. You know what it's like to have God's unfailing love envelop you. In the King James Version, it puts a therefore between these two statements. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. And basically what this verse is saying is that since people see how wonderful God's love is, they're going to run to him and take refuge in him. And see, this love is available even if you haven't experienced it. 
And I want to tell you, if you're here this morning or watching online, if you haven't experienced taking refuge in Jesus, you ought to give it a try. We'll never be sorry. You'll experience a peace and a calm that the world can't offer. And when the Bible uses this phrase, under his wings, quite a bit, actually, in Scripture it's used. It's a perfect picture of safety, because that is just the perfect picture, seeing a mother bird on her nest, protecting her young. That's a beautiful picture of safety. It's a beautiful picture of God's intimate love and protection for us. But then David speaks about the abundant blessings of living in God's love. Really overflowing blessings. Verse 8, they feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights. And David's using an analogy here of living in a home where there is no shortage of provision. I didn't know what it was like growing up to have a shortage of food. In fact, I probably, was probably too much, maybe because I was pretty chunky. I was pretty proud of the fact that I could down five tacos or five hamburgers at a meal. I mean, that, I wouldn't recommend that. Just a lot of food. My mother was an awesome cook. I never knew what it was like to have a shortage of food, but it would be very hard, I would imagine, and I, we see it today, not knowing where your next meal is coming from. But think about this. If you're a Christian, then God will provide you with all the spiritual nourishment that you need. So many Christians think, I have to do it on my own. I've got to use my own strength. I have to make it. But we see time and time again, that doesn't work. We need to stay close to Jesus. He'll provide us with the direction, the nourishment, the spiritual guidance that we need. <coughs> Excuse me. And this also applies to the blessings of being a child of God. No, not that we'll have a better life than others when it comes to earthly goods, but the spiritual blessings of being a Christian, peace and joy, just those two. I mean, it's enough. And there's so many more. In fact, David mentions those blessings by using a river as an analogy. A river is a constant source of fresh water. It's usually always flowing, most times. And the blessings of being a Christian, no, they might not be visible like what we describe as earthly blessings, these expensive things, but inside... Our souls, those blessings flow abundantly. And I'm reminded of the passage in Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. I love that phrase. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And that is just such a powerful verse. God's blessings, like a river, are a fresh supply. And how awesome is that? And then David describes God's blessings some more. In verse 9, For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. In Jesus we have new life. The old life is gone, and we live a new life in him. But it isn't just this once and done thing. It's constant. It's a fountain. Which to me, a fountain is more fresh than a river because it's kind of like a spring, like a mountain spring coming out of the mountain. It's new life every day. What a blessing that is. God created light and he is light. So what this verse is saying is that when God shines his light in our dark hearts, it illuminates where we need to change. And through him, we can clearly see how we need to live. And bear in mind, it's God's light. It's not our light. So don't go shining your light on someone else. Let him shine his light on them, and they can see just like you did. Martha shared with me some time ago about let your light shine or shine your light. You remember that, Martha? How a little boy, you give him a flashlight, and the first thing he'll do is shine it right in your eyes because they think it's funny. But that's not letting your light shine, that's shining your light. And I love that analogy. I'll, I'll never forget it, Martha. It's really cool how we as Christians don't shine our light right in someone's eyes and make them offended, but rather let your light shine so they can see your testimony. Then let's wrap things up the last three verses and see what the Lord will do for us if we continue to serve him. 10 to 12. Continue your love to those who know you, your righteousness to the upright in heart. 
May the foot of the proud not come against me, nor the hand of the wicked drive me away. See how the evildoers lie fallen, thrown down, not able to rise. Let's ask the Lord to keep us in his love. You know that it is through his love and only through his love that we can stay close to him. You know one prayer, you know, you know how people sometimes will ask, why doesn't God answer that prayer? Or how, how do you know if God answers a prayer? Or, you know, a lot of questions like that. Well, there's sometimes you pray, a pray, I'll get it out, a prayer that you pray is sometimes a selfish prayer. Then God just simply won't answer that because it's selfish. Or maybe it's not in his timing. Or whatever, you know, you have to wait on God's timing. But there is one prayer for sure that God will always answer if you pray it. And that is, Lord, keep me close to you. Don't let me go. If our desire is to stay close to him, he will help us do that. <clears throat> and it is then that when the enemy comes to tempt us or discourage us by whatever means he chooses, then God will keep us strong. Just like David said, they would not succeed. And when they try... They will fall helpless. Could it be that whenever we feel like the enemy is winning, it's because we aren't turning to God during those times? I had to think about that. Because there are times I feel discouraged. And maybe I'm not turning to God enough here. We are promised that the enemy will not win. So let's take this promise that God will not let evil destroy us and we will win if we stay with God on his side. Would you stand with me, please? I love God's word and how it can speak to us, and I hope it I hope it spoke to you today. That's right. Thank you, Lord, for your word and the beautiful blessings that come from studying it and learning about it. And I pray you help this truth to be made strong in hearts today. That we will see that even if we failed, even if um, we're concerned about the evil that's around us. We know that your love overcomes all, and that if we stay close to you, you will help us win in the end. I pray you encourage each person here, keep them strong in you, and would you help them to lean on you with all their hearts. We thank you, Lord, for all you do for us. And I pray you'll bless each person today in a special way. In your name, amen. Amen.